Hello and welcome to the Bible study hour. It is good to be back with you. I know last week our church staff had a little bit of fun. They all put on a Pastor Jeff mask, but I'm back. So no need for a Pastor Jeff mask, but here we do have Jody. We thought we'd have a little fun with Jody this morning, but we wanted an accurate depiction of Jody. So for the last half hour, Jody has been depicting himself on this mask. Hi, Jody. Welcome to the Bible study hour. We are here to promote Back to School Week. Back to School Week is upon us. And here is Jody. Hello! We wanted to make the mask a little more accurate, and we wanted Jody to be able to talk to all of you. Yeah. So we made a few adjustments Talking. to the mask. Hello. Back to School Week starts tonight with prayer for our schools. Um. Yes, prayer tonight for our schools. We will be praying on the campus of our two adopted schools. That's SSES and our high school. So we would love for you to show up to one of those campuses somewhere between the window of 6 and 6.30. You will have access to the campus and we will walk through and pray for the upcoming school year. So that's tonight. And then Wednesday, August 17th, we are back to the full Wednesday Woo! night. Food no, 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 no. So much food. That includes our meal starting at 5, no, not 5.45. 445. 4.45. We're not here early. We are not going to do a second take on nope. this. Meals resume at 4.45 and Bible study hour and all other Wednesday night activities beginning at 6 p.m. We are back to the full Wednesday night program. And then Friday, yeah, Cannonball! August 19th is back to school splash at Greenville Splash Kingdom. We would love to have you there 6 to 8 p.m. We are inviting the whole church. We will have the place to ourselves. So if you are a part of First Baptist Church, we would love to have you there. Can you invite a friend? Yes! Of course you can, but we need you to RSVP. We need to know how many people are coming right so now. You, so you can head to our website. Yes, and do this 
right now. Head to our website and RSVP, you and your entire family. When you're making the RSVP, list your entire family so we can know who is going to be there. You know what, Pastor there. Jeff? Yes, tell there me. There will also be door prizes there. Door prizes? You could win something yes, awesome. Yes, absolutely. And you cannot win a door prize. If you're not present. If you're not present and if you do not RSVP. So we need to know that you are coming. So that is back to school week. That's a lot of information. If you have questions, head to our church website, call the church office, find a friend who actually pays attention to stuff, <laughs> read your bulletin. You can always read your bulletin. We still have those? We sure do. Back to school week, starting tonight. Thank you so much for attending the Bible study hour. We appreciate your faithfulness to digging into God's word and building relationships with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. If you haven't joined us for worship today, come 11 o'clock in the worship center. And then tonight, something special. Prayer for our schools. Meet us on the campus of SSES or the high school somewhere between 6 and 6.30 to pray for the upcoming school year. You have a blessed week. It's like I don't even have a mask on. You know? yeah, I mean, I, I can't just tell. Go out like this. I can't tell. What do you think, Candace? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day Don Deaton to start our assault here this morning. <coughs> Good to see you this morning, Don. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Father, we just thank you for life itself. We thank you, Lord, for sacrificing your son that we might have eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for each one of us. We thank you, Lord, for the strength and the courage you give each one of us. We just now pray for the one that's teaching today, that you might give him the words, Lord, that they would glorify you alone, that each one of us and everyone listening by TV and radio would receive a blessing from hearing your word. Forgive us our many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've got a good crowd this morning. we got a gold star teacher here already. <laughs> good to see you all this morning. <laughs> this is the uh, First Baptist Church uh, Busy Bands. I got it right, didn't I? Yeah. No, it ain't. It's not now. But we're still busy, but we're, we're not as busy as we were. Anyway, we're glad to have all of you here. And you that are listening on radio or TV, watching TV, we're glad you're here. There was another. We got just one man here this morning. You, you're you're by yourself this morning. I want you to know. I mean, you, you're on your own. No, no. Sandra Glenn's ready. Two ninety, number two ninety. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of thanks and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died.
Thank you. That's good, good singing. Brother James Scott is our teacher this morning. And we're definitely glad to see you, James. Good to be here. Yes, sir. <laughs> good to be seen. Yes. <laughs> oh. When did you find out? Uh, I think Thursday. I think Thursday. So, the, um, <laughs> but was glad to be able to do it. I, in preparing for school, uh, I've already had a week of coaching under my belt. Thankfully, we don't do two a days in my sport. Uh, but we do have to be there, have to get up at five something in the morning to get there, which is, you know, one of the shocks to your system when you start back to school is getting up at five something in the morning. Um, the, uh, the early rising thing I learned from my grandfather on his dairy farm because he was a twice a day, uh, we'd twice a day milked and, uh, it was a, um, butterfat operation, meaning most of our cows were Jersey. We only had a few, um, we had a few Holsteins for volume, but butterfat Jersey. Uh, he bought his equipment from a young businessman at the time. This was in near Carthage, Texas, between Carthage and Beckville, Texas. The young businessman he bought most of his equipment from when he needed equipment was a fellow named John Willis. And uh, he'd get that from him. And in, when I was little, uh, only not that little, when I was medium, we had a great county agent there, a uh, tremendous county agent named Gordon Ford uh, there for Panola County. And uh, that was a great addition as well. But I had to learn, you know, you get up before 530, and that was something for a child to do. But I found the milking so exciting that it was, uh, it was entirely worth it. Didn't get hit by that again until I spent a happy summer of my college in Marine Officer Candidate School in Quantico and uh, learned that they got up at 4.30 in the morning. And uh, I learned it the first morning as trash cans were, giant metal trash cans were slung down the squad bay. And these men walked in yelling at the top of their lungs, and you had no choice but to be up right then and on your toes. And um, I felt kind of strange that I had been so scared by that experience. But within two or three days, I was feeling better because there were guys going through it with me who were Vietnam veterans who were scared. <laughs> the sergeants can literally scare you that badly. And later, one of the sergeants confessed that. Uh, the scariest he ever got was not when he was an 82nd Airborne fighting the Central Highlands of Vietnam uh, on long patrols, long missions. The scariest he ever got was when he came back from Vietnam, got into trouble with the law in California, uh, got into a fight in a bar somewhere in Los Angeles, and the judge said he'd let him go if he went back into the service, so he signed up for the Marines. And... Um, had a little shuttle flight from Los Angeles to San Diego, and on that shuttle flight, they were serving alcohol, and the businessman next to him was a World War II veteran who said, here, and just filled him up with alcohol. So by the time he got to MCRD San Diego, to the base there, he said uh, he was just weaving, barely upright, until the biggest man he'd ever seen in his life appeared with a Smokey the Bear hat, pulled down low, and started yelling at him. He said, I managed to keep my feet exactly on those yellow footprints I was weaving, I wet myself. He said, I was never so scared by the Viet Cong as I was by that Marine sergeant. <laughs> now, those of you who've been through boot camp or some form of boot camp, I keep looking for William every time I say this. How many of you can relate to that feeling of, of intimidation? <laughs> <laughs> I did things I did not know I could do simply because I was so terrified of, or I had a healthy fear of the DIs and the drill sergeants. Right outside our barracks, we had a three and a half story platform it was just nothing for three and a half stories and then a group of logs and each log was about five feet apart and I realized you had to climb that ladder and then run across those run across those five feet apart I thought there's no way I can do that until the sergeant started yelling I was so much more scared of him than I was of dying <laughs> it just was not an issue it was not a problem well we're going to see here, we have some kings who got scared, and we're in Second Kings, 
uh, chapter 17, and their fear was often not a healthy fear. Their fear was often a very unhealthy fear. And I like the old British army maxim from the uh, 1800s. When the British Army served in India and Africa and different parts of the world, they had a very simple uh, slogan they gave to each young recruit. Fear God, honor the queen, shoot straight, and keep clean. <laughs> Sounds a good basic way for life right there. Um, who would that queen have been in the 1800s, by the way? Victoria. Victoria. <laughs> that was the Victorian era. Well... Here we are, and we're looking at chapter 17, and would help if I were in 2 Kings. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Aiah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Well, big deal. Every single king of Israel to that point had done evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. He was the only halfway good king in the history of the northern kingdom. He is the only one who gets that type of a um, gets that type of a commendation. You weren't as bad as those who came before you. It kind of reminds me of addressing the angels of the seven churches of Asia in, uh, or addressing the seven churches of Asia in uh, Revelation. Which church, what do they say about Laodicea? Anybody remember? <laughs> I wish that you were hot or you were cold. As it is, you are lukewarm, and I'll spit you out of my mouth. Okay. In other words, you're not completely evil. It's just you're not completely good either. And so after the compliments that are paid to Philadelphia and a couple of the other churches, then Laodicea gets that type of a, of a thing. Uh, it's interesting because Laodicea was the scene of a hot springs with mineral water. And the mineral water tasted terrible. And it's always served lukewarm. It always came out of the ground lukewarm. But it was supposed to be good for you to drink it like bad medicine, bad tasting medicine. But you were supposed to drink it. And people would go to Laodicea just to drink that stuff. Therefore, John chose a very good metaphor when he was talking about lukewarm, and I want to spit you out of my mouth when it came to Laodicea. Well, here you have Hoshea. The name is comparable to Joshua, or what would the name Joshua be in Greek? Jesus. Salvation. Uh, Joshua was one of the most flawless people that appeared in the Old Testament. He just was spectacular. I like the way he was portrayed in Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments because he just was always there at the right place at the right time. Um, Hoshea um, was not the worst king. <laughs> he, in some ways, as, as bad as he may have been, he was the best of these kings. This comes 200 years after the northern kingdom had split from the southern kingdom. Rehoboam had provoked a revolt through, I think it's fair to say, stupidity. The uh, ruling stupidity of uh, being born with a silver spoon in your mouth and thinking that everyone had to, that you were entitled to everyone's absolute loyalty. You didn't have to serve the people. You didn't have to do anything like that. And he split the kingdom with sheer stupidity. Um, I mentioned to a friend today that there were three different evangelists, televangelists, famous as televangelists, uh, who had come up with some interesting statements in the decades of their teaching. Interesting statements that, while I don't think they uh, are necessarily going to send anyone to hell, they were a little disturbing. But for me, not in the disturbing sense, just in the pure stupidity sense. <laughs> that they believe this about the Holy Spirit, or they believe that about the Holy Spirit, or they believe this. I would rank it as not heresy, just stupidity. And, uh, you know, which is not a good thing. 
Stupidity can do terrible things. The worst combination, I've heard people say this, all the way back to the 1980s when new methods of being corporate bosses were coming out, people saying, okay, you know, there's a <clears throat> new methodology in the workplace, the business model of the 80s, the business model of the 90s. Um, you are doing this. You're, uh, the corporate culture has changed. It's a whole new corporate culture. Uh, someone pointed out to me, he said, I can handle a boss who is, and they're talking about CFO, COO, CEO, I can handle a boss who is stupid, or I can handle a boss who is arrogant. What I can't handle is someone who is both. <laughs> stupid plus arrogant was the fatal, fatal thing. And apparently, Hosea may have had the arrogance. I'm not sure he had the stupidity, but something was not going right with him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid him tribute. Okay, now what is going on here? The king of Assyria. When I was in college, I read textbooks that, in reference to the kingdom of Israel, David and Solomon, suggested it was not possible for David and Solomon to have as much power as they had regionally because they were caught between the two superpowers that control the Middle East for millennia. The Mesopotamian powers, whether that meant the Sumerians or the Akkadians or the old Babylonians or the Hurrian, the um, uh, Metianites or whether it was the Hittites, and then Egypt, that was always, whether it was Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, or New Kingdom, they dominated. They said there's no way anybody on that land bridge in between the Mesopotamian empires and the Egyptian empire could ever have thrived as a kingdom. Well, now they have changed their tune. They're starting to say the Bible was right. Um, and it had to do with an interesting phenomena, climate change. Around the year 1200 and extending all the way till about 900 BC, 1200 BC, 900 BC, every major empire in the world collapsed in a 300 year period. The Egyptian New Kingdom collapsed. The various, the Hittite state collapsed. The various kingdoms of Mesopotamia collapsed. The uh, Chinese um, uh, original dynasty collapsed there on the Yellow River. And they say it was due to climate change, that there was a whole series, the Mycenaean kingdom of uh, Agamemnon and Achilles and Odysseus, all that collapsed at about that time. The Minoan Empire on Crete collapsed. And they say drought destroyed their resource base. Long-term drought destroyed their resource base. However, in places that did not experience drought, previously tiny kingdoms were able to surge to the front, were able to rise. And guess what land was blessed by God not to have drought during the time of David and Solomon? It was the land of Israel. And very much there was a power vacuum that they could fill. It says in the Bible they controlled everything from the river Egypt to the Euphrates. And with good reason. Those previously big powers to the north and south were in a crumbling state at that time. And Israel could rise in the time of David and Solomon and taking all that. They were blessed with a food supply. <laughs> they were blessed with the right weather. They were blessed with the right conditions. After Rehoboam wrecked the kingdom and Jeroboam took over the northern tribes, Things began to go gradually south for everybody in that region, but the big powers began to recover after that. And so they spent much of their reign being hammered by their neighbors once again. Both the northern tribes of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah began to get pummeled generation after generation by the Mesopotamian kingdoms to the north and the Egyptian kingdom to the south. You can pick which one. They were both bullies of the area. And there was no longer a united kingdom to stand up to them or to show God's power of blessing his people. The 
Assyrians were an interesting group. They were the ones who really rose in Mesopotamia after the year 900. They began to surge. They controlled the area of northern Iraq and gradually took over southern Iraq and gradually took over half of what is today Turkey and eventually moved down and conquered Egypt and they moved partway through Iran. They were the first empire to fully unite the Fertile Crescent. And the Assyrians were greatly hated and feared because of their strength and their power. Um, they were known as one of the cruelest peoples in terms of their military policy that had ever been seen. You did not want to have Assyria coming against you because if you resisted them, they punished you in horrible ways. And we have all through Books of Kings and Chronicles episodes involving the Assyrians. You wanted to pay them off if you could. Anything but have to deal with them. Why? Their armies were the largest the world had yet seen. They had organized the first national conscription draft of an entire population of manpower and organized it. They really were, in spite of their cruelty, a incredibly industrious and innovative people. They invented a postal service. And they paved roads with stone for the first time. Actual paved uh, brick roads with stone to make their Pony Express even faster. They were the first kingdom to make full use of iron instead of bronze. Have entire armies equipped with iron instead of just bronze, which was too expensive for the average soldier. With iron, every soldier could have a weapon. They got good at that. They built iron chariots. They invented the spoked wheel for the chariot. Why is a spoked wheel an advantage? Because it's not one solid mass of wood. <laughs> it is, or in their case, they could probably even use iron for the wheels because they were spoked. They weren't a solid, awkward mass. They, in mathematics, worked with base 60. They decided that time should be done in seconds and there should be 60 seconds to a minute and 60 minutes to an hour. And they came up with that. They came up with the idea that a circle is 360 degrees and your directions in a circle should be based upon that. They invented the potter's wheel uh, for doing pottery. Their overall achievements were quite impressive. Their knowledge of the stars was very, very good. They were able to do eclipse calculations and they had every bit of math just bordering on pre-calculus, except no trigonometry. That would be a Greek thing. Yet they were prosperous, they were innovative, they were inventive, and they were ruthlessly cruel. If you did not surrender, they took all the men of your city once they had captured you, and they were flayed alive in front of everybody. I won't go into that. Um, common people were simply impaled. They would have a forest of impaled victims to mark where a city was that they had captured. Pyramids of human heads, things like that. Burning the young people alive in bonfires, taking all the young teenagers. I mean, they were just as cruel as anyone had ever been. No one had seen cruelty like that. And the survivors, they would move them out. They would take them from one end of their empire and drop them in another. Pick up this group, drop it in another. How? So those people would be discombobulated and unable to foment revolt in the future because they were out of their home territory. That way they kept everyone off balance. And a special cruelty, when they marched you off into exile, if they were especially mad at you, they did it not with people in chains, but with people having a fishing line through their nostrils of the person in front, the person behind, and you all walked in a long line, basically with fish hooks through your noses and a fishing line connecting, and you're praying that the guy in front of you doesn't sneeze or anything. This was the Assyrians. They were hated, they were feared, 
they were terrifying, and they were the regional superpower after the year 900. Nobody wanted to have to mess with them, yet their cruelty often provoked revolts, but nonetheless, they were just so hated by so many. A prophet was told to go to their capital city, but like everyone else in the region, he hated the Assyrians so much, he wanted them to go to hell that he would not go and preach to them. He jumped on a ship instead. And that was a prophet named Jonah. He was not going to go to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh and preach to these evil people. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want them to get saved. And he did his best to stay away from that. Well, now we see the Assyrians coming against the northern kingdom of Israel yet again. The Assyrians are getting ready to be um, violent. Shamanesser was the son of Tiglath-Pileser. These are some of the best names. You know, you want to use these names sometime. I don't think you want a grandchild named one of these, but uh, although believe me, I've heard some strange names uh, lately. I had a professor at Baylor who was dealing with the fact that her daughter who is in California and part of a certain 1960s movement in California, had named her uh, daughter, her two daughters, Clytemnestra and Andromeda, and a son named a son named Zeus. Um, but um, and this was a professor who'd grown up in First Baptist Church of Dallas under George W. Truett, so this was a little bit far from her experience, but. Um, these names are just so interesting. Tiglath-Pileser was a very successful ruler, emperor of Assyria. And he actually had a bright idea. Instead of having just 10 or 11 provinces for the empire, he split them into about 60. That way, each governor would only have so many resources at his disposal. Why wouldn't you want a highly ambitious governor to have more resources at his disposal? Yeah, <laughs> for when he turns against you, for when he rises up. Apparently, there was not a lot of love lost between some fathers and sons in the history of the Assyrians. Uh, sons doing with, with their dads so they could take over sooner was a big part of it. I don't know if any of you have ever read all... Has anyone here ever read all seven of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis? Okay. One of my favorite is a book that um, C.S. Lewis said should actually be part one. And, or a part two, excuse me, and that is A Horse and His Boy, and the Calramine Empire, that are the evil empire south of Narnia, are based on the Assyrians, culturally most heavily. C.S. Lewis didn't have to go very far to find a good pattern for an evil empire there. And Israel's, Israel was closer to the Assyrian Empire than Judah was. The southern kingdom was a little bit further removed. Also, Judah didn't occupy the major trade routes that Assyrian merchants would have used. Israel did, so they did have contact with them, but hopefully they did not have military contact. It's what they did not want to have. Nobody did. Uh, the Assyrians were just that dangerous to mess with. And now you have a king who is messing with them. The son of Tiglath-Pileser has taken over Shalmaneser. Hoshea had paid tribute to Tiglath-Pileser. But now the sun has taken over. As a temptation, if there's a takeover by a sun, to see what he's made of. Maybe he's not as the same stern stuff of his dad. Maybe we can get away with something here. And so Hosea quit sending the annual cash payment. Now, if you're sending a cash payment to Al Capone, it's called what? And you have to do it constantly. It's called what kind of money? Protection. protection money. It's a bribe for the sake of protection. And you do it on a regular basis. That's your protection money. You don't pay your protection money, something bad happens. Um, he quit paying the Assyrians their protection money. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hoshea was a traitor to him. For he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt and no longer paid tribute to king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shamanasser seized him and put him in prison. He just came down and grabbed him. Or, 
he could have waited till he came to explain himself and then put him in prison. He was, after all, the vassal to Shalmaneser. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. Samaria was the big city that was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem remained the capital of the southern kingdom. By the way, one of the nice things that Hosea had done, it mentions it in Chronicles, he had taken down the border guards. They didn't have border guards to the south to keep people of Judah out. They had border guards to the south to keep people of Israel from going to Jerusalem. That had started with Jeroboam 200 years earlier when he split from Solomon's son and set up the northern kingdom. He did not want them going to Jerusalem to worship. He set up alternative shrines with calves to worship at Dan and Bethel. It says that Hosea left the calves up at Dan and Bethel, which suggests he might have thought about removing them. But the very least he had done, after 200 years of border guards keeping people from going to Passover or going to anything else in Jerusalem or worshiping in Jerusalem, he took the border guards down and told his people, you can go. You want to go to Jerusalem and worship? Go for it. In that sense, he was a nicer king than Israel ever had before, but now he has blown it. He did something utterly stupid in regard to um, the king of Assyria. <clears throat> he quit paying the annual tribute, and even worse, he tried to get help from Egypt. His political advice was not very good. I don't know who his political advisors were, but they didn't know their head from a hole in the ground even better than Rehoboam's had known their head from a hole in the ground. Because if so, they would have known that the king of Egypt at that time was involved in a dynastic squabble between one side of the family and the Ethiopian side of the family. It was almost like War of the Roses down there. There was no way they were going to have a chance to get up and help him if the Assyrians came against him. He'd put his faith in the wrong person. As one prophet had said to a king, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in our God. We'll trust in the name of our God. We will trust in God. And Hosea wasn't quite faithful enough to trust in God. He tried to play a double game, and it cost him. He got thrown into jail. And now Assyria has come against the whole kingdom <clears throat> for the purpose of conquest. <clears throat> All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. In the southern kingdom, you have good king, good king, okay king, good king, bad king, good king, good king, okay king, bad king, good king, good king. It just went like that. In the northern tribes, it was bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, bad king, in a spiritual sense. They just were, their morality was questionable, and their spiritual morality was non-existent. And they had led the people horribly astray. <clears throat> The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord, their God, that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. Alternative worship spots. Probably would have been okay if they'd stuck to worshiping God. <coughs> the Lord, their God, who led them out of Egypt, the God of their fathers, and worshiped Him alone. But instead, they fell into what one generation or another of them would think was a cool practice of the Canaanites who were here before us. Let's go retro. Let's see what the Canaanites are worshiping, and let's try that. Let's see what the Assyrians are doing and Syrians are doing. Let's try that. And they were encouraged in this by their kings. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. Asherah was the first fertility goddess sometimes known as Ashtar or Ishtar, and with a sexual element to the worship aspect. At every high place they burned incense, as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. Burning of incense means showing extreme reverence for these gods and goddesses and idols that were set up there. They did wicked things that provoked the Lord to anger. They worshipped idols, 
the Lord had said, you shall not do this. Where does he say that? Where does God say, you shall not make unto yourself a graven image? Ten commandments. Ten commandments meant nothing to most of the people of the northern kingdom. Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as those fathers, as their fathers who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. Pretty strong words. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. And they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and as an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. In the Canaanites and Phoenician groups, sacrificing your firstborn child as a fiery burnt offering was mandatory in some city-states. Usually it was to a god called Moloch or Adramaloch, who was a metal idol with two hands and a burning hearth. So you put your child in the hand so it could be consumed by flames. And this isn't just the Bible referring to that. Roman authors spoke of it as they watched what the Carthaginians did. The Carthaginians were Canaanites. They were Phoenicians who had just moved west. And the Romans got physically ill. And believe me, the Romans were no strangers to bloodshed and no strangers to all types of horrors. But for this worship practice to horrify the Romans would to say something right there. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left in the south. And even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. What had helped Israel was that the line of David had remained Mostly, not entirely, but mostly faithful. Most of David's descendants who ruled Judah had remained faithful to God, but not all of them. There were three, I can think of, who were as bad as Israel and actually sacrificed their children as burnt offerings. But most were good, and so they had a longer grace period before they were going to experience something like Israel had just experienced. Israel, the northern kingdom, had experienced total conquest by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom would have another five generations before they were grabbed by the Babylonians and taken away to Babylon. When he tore Israel away from the house of David, that's when Rehoboam, son of Solomon, had messed up. They made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, their king. Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord and caused them to commit a great sin. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence as he had warned through all his servants and prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from the homeland into an exile in Assyria and they are still there. In Chronicles it tells us exactly where they took them. Um, it's an area where we were involved in pretty good fighting 10 years ago. Uh, the area uh, near Mosul. And uh, northern area, uh, that's actually where Saddam Hussein's sons got, uh, the murderous sons of Saddam Hussein, horrible serial killers, were trapped and killed by U.S. Marines. Um, it's also Haran is nearby. That's where God first spoke to Abraham and said, go to a land that I will show you. That territory today, it is northwestern Iran, northeastern Iraq is that borderland right there. Near the source and headwaters of the Euphrates River is where they drop them off right there. Right where Iran, Iraq, and Azerbaijan all run together and Turkey nearby. So we're talking way to the northeast, about as northeastward as you get of anybody in the Bible. 
and that's where they dumped them off. They had had great blessings from God, and they turned them down. Sixty years earlier, they had had a brief golden age under Jeroboam II. Assyria had started attacking Aram or Syria, and Aram or Syria began to crumble. And the wealthy men of Israel discovered you could buy holiday condos in Syrian towns like Hamath and others for a song. And they went in and built holiday villas, and their economy prospered. But then their sin caught up with them once again. I'd always wondered why Assyria didn't attack Israel at that point if they were acting so prosperous. But there was about a 30-year period from about 800 to about 770 in which Assyria, at the top of its game, didn't victimize people too much. They just kind of uh, were there. But there wasn't any bad stuff being done. People weren't being tortured in large numbers. Cities weren't being burned. People weren't being impaled. It's almost like they had repented for a generation. And so I've always wondered, was that the generation who heard the preaching of who in Nineveh? Jonah. Maybe that's the repentant generation that Jonah talked about. But after that generation, they took off and were as bad as ever. <laughs> <laughs> and proceeded to eventually destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuthaf, Aveh, Hamath, and Sepharim. These are towns all over the Assyrian Empire from north to south. And he settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites that he had taken away, probably with fish hooks through their noses. We know he took away 27,920 upper and middle class people, the leaders of society, been taken away. Now he's putting other peoples in their places. They took over Samaria and lived in its towns. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord, so he sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. It was reported to the king of Assyria. Yes, they did have lions in the Holy Land once upon a time. The species is the Asiatic lion. It uh, can still be found in the forests of India, but that's about where it is. Um, the last one in the Holy Land was killed in the 1200s. But you might remember that who crushed a lion to death by ripping its jaws when it attacked him on the way to visit a girlfriend in, among the Philistines. Samson. Samson. And David reported killing one with a sling. So yeah, the lions did exist, but now they have gotten out. It's like a plague of lions. We've seen this in Africa. We had the famous Maneaters of Savo. Uh, that was the source of a good movie with Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas a few years ago. True story. I did part of my master's thesis dealing with the construction of that railway. Um, from 1932 to 1947, you had over 600, possibly as many as 1,500 Tanzanians killed by a pride of 15 lions over a 15-year period. Uh, the British were trying to protect the cattle, so they shot everything they thought that might carry render pest, all the deer, all the gazelles, all the zebras, everything, which left the lions with no food source. So they turned to local villagers. And you had that plague of lions down there. There was a lion in northern Tanzania who in 2004 killed 60 people over a four-year period. His name was Osama. And this was before anybody had heard the name in America. This was before anybody outside Chicago knew there was someone named Osama out there. But Osama simply means lion in the Arabic dialect that made Swahili. Swahili, Osama for lion. Simba or Osama, and it was a bad deal. So plagues of lions have happened. So what did they do? They complained to the emperor of the Assyrians. The emperor of the Assyrians looked around among the people he'd ripped away, found a Levite priest, and sent him back and said, tell the people about your God. People in those days believed that gods were regional and that that's why they were under a curse. They weren't following the regional way they were supposed to. He came back and preached to them. They continued to practice some of their pagan ways, but they gave it an overlay of the Jewish faith. Over time, Judaism gradually won out for the most part. Nonetheless, these non-Jewish people worshiping the Jews, worshiping the Jewish faith in and around the city of Samaria in later centuries would be known to the Jews as the what? 
these semi-Jewish Samaritans. These were the hated Samaritans of Jesus' day. The ones that all the Jews would have nothing to do with because they were <clears throat> of non-Jewish blood and their religion wasn't pure. So they thought. And so that is where they came from. To this day, it says... They would not listen, however, persisted in their former practice. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. That's basically what the northern kingdom is.